Hi, and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh, and I'm going to be talking about SN1 versus SN2 reactions today. Organic chemistry, at its best, talks about different kinds of reactions and makes it very clear as to what those reactions are. This is an example of, both of these are examples of that clarity, right? So in terms of this acronym, every part of this acronym means something. The S means substitution, N means nucleophilic, and the one and the two really talk about reaction kinetics, which is entirely opposite of what most students think, which is the number of steps. They think it's the number of steps of that particular reaction. That's not actually what's true here. So let's take an example. All right, let's take an example where I have CH3 here. I have a BR here. And maybe I have an H there. Okay. So this is what we would call a secondary alkyl halide. Why is it a secondary alkyl halide? Because the carbon that is directly bonded to the halide is bonded to two other carbons. Okay. What's interesting here is that SN2 reactions can happen with primary or secondary alkyl halides. And I'm showing one that actually has a chirality center for a reason. Okay. I'm going to react that with a strong nucleophile. Any strong nucleophile or strong, strong nucleophiles and strong bases are actually different entities, but often they are the same. Okay. Uh, often a strong nucleophile is also a strong base kind of deal. Not always the same, not always true but a lot of the time it is. Okay, so in terms of looking at this, I have a strong nucleophile. How do I know that it's a strong nucleophile? Well, that O has three lone pairs. We know that to be a nucleophile, it has to be electron rich, which means that it has to have lone pairs or pi electrons that can be reacted to form bonds with something that is electron deficient. And it has a minus charge. Minus charge is kind of the dead giveaway, by the way that it is a strong nucleophile. In terms of my electrophile, I then have to figure out what part of this other reactant is the electrophile. And if I look at this for a minute, I would usually pick that carbon. And why am I picking this carbon right here? The reason why is because that's the carbon that's directly bonded to the bromine. And because it's directly bonded to the bromine, the bromine is electronegative. That means that this, if this was a partial minus, because it's electronegative, that makes the other side of this bond electropositive, which means that this is my electrophile. Okay? In essence, a Lewis acid, and it is electron deficient. If I want to show what's going on in terms of the attack here, get a better pink marker than I have at the moment. It is what the attacks that we've been looking at over and over and over again. So. In essence, I'm going to have, I guess all the pink markers are kind of squeaky. Okay, I'm going to take one of those lone pairs on the electron-rich entity, the nucleophile, and I'm going to attack the electron-deficient entity, which is the electrophile. Right? Notice that I attacked from the opposite side of the bromine. This is very important. Bromine is a big <laughs> atom. And basically, it locks up whatever side it's on. So it, it basically crowds. Nothing can get in because there's too much steric hindrance. Steric hindrance meaning that atoms would be in an arrangement. They would be too close to one another for their own comfort. Right? So in terms of steric hindrance, bromine is locking up an entire side, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Right? In terms of when this attacks, right, it's going to attack from the less crowded side, whatever that looks like. And in this case, that's actually the side that has the CH3. But notice something else that goes on. When you have this bond being made, right, so this lone pair attacks the C, and the C and the O then make a bond. At the same time that's happening, something else has to happen. And how do I know that? The reason why I know that is because C can only have four bonds around it in any given time. There's one, two, three, four already there. 
you make a new bond, that's five. That's not going to work. So at the same time that this nucleophile is attacking from the opposite side of the bromine, the bromine is actually coming off. Okay? That's why it's called a leaving group, guys. The reason why it's called a leaving group is because it wants to leave, right? So in that case, when this happens, you have attack from the opposite side of the bromine. That's going to push the CH3 forward. The methyl group is going to come forward or come towards where the bromine was, if you want to visualize that however you're looking. And then the bromine comes off at the exact same time. What does that make? It makes a C with the CH3 coming out towards you. The H hasn't changed position whatsoever. And now, coming off the back, you have your nucleophile. Okay? Because, and this all happens at once, just as an FYI, the nucleophil nucleophile attacks. The leaving group leaves. Both of those at the exact same time. So if I were going to write a rate law that designated this SN2 reaction, I would show that the rate is equal to some reaction or some rate constant, right? Times whatever nucleophile I'm using times the leaving group. All right, so the leaving, concentration of the leaving group, the leaving group leaves, that's important. The nucleophile attacks, that's important. Because both of these have a reaction order. Remember, the reaction order is a superscript by these brackets. The reaction order here is 1 because it's not written down. The reaction order here is 1 because it's not written down. The reaction, overall reaction order for this reaction is one from the nucleophile plus one from the leaving group, which makes two. That's the reason why it's called an SN2 reaction. Not because it happens in two steps. It actually happens in one step. <laughs> it's only the reaction, it re happens all at once. It's called a concerted reaction. But it's called two because of its overall reaction order. Notice as well, that you had what we call an inversion of configuration. The CH3 was originally in the back, it's now in the front, okay? Because basically, whatever the halide was locked up the entire side that it was originally on. And so the nucleophile has to attack from the opposite side, which pushes anything that was there forward because the leaving group leaves, that halide leaves. And because of that, we say that this comes with an inversion sorry, inversion of configuration. Boy, that is super squeaky. I am squeaky today. <laughs> sorry. All right, so in terms of this, I'm getting another marker here. Sometimes call, folks call this a backside attack. <laughs> it's totally fine to call it that. It's a great moment. But the way we would properly talk about it in terms of organic chemistry and what the outcome is, we would talk about an inversion of configuration. All right. And that may matter, it may not, right? So in this particular case, it mattered because this carbon right there, that carbon that I've been detailing out here, is a chiral carbon. It is a stereogenic center. And it actually matters whether it has an inversion of configuration. If it's at the end, if it's a primary alkyl halide, which had two of the same, which would be H's, then it, it doesn't matter that much that there was an inversion of configuration, OK? Because that is not a chiral, chirality center that you had to begin with or that you made. OK, how is this different than the SN1 reaction? The ones, so the twos, by the way, SN2, E2, actually both of those happen in one step. They're a concerted reaction. The two talks about their kinetics, their, re their overall reaction order, not about the number of steps that they happen in. Okay, And the only difference between the E's and the SN's 
is that with ease, it's an elimination reaction, which means that you form a multiple bond where there wasn't one to begin with, like a double bond or a triple bond. SNs replace something. So in other words, you originally had bromine in our original reaction, and you replaced it with a methoxy group, OCH3. OK, let's change that to something a little more interesting here. So let's do C. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a CH3, a CH3. Maybe we'll make this uh, wedge. And then let's make this a BR. Tertiary alkyl halides to under, tend to undergo, instead of SN2 reactions, they tend to undergo SN1 reactions. What happens with the ones? What happens with the ones, whether that's an E1 or an SN1, okay, difference there being whether you eliminate a hydrogen and form a multiple bond, like a double bond, or whether you have an SN, which would be a substitution. Okay, the first thing that happens with the ones always is that the leaving group has got to leave. Okay, that's all that happens. That's the first step. Always, if it's an alkyl halide, then it just leaves. If it's an alcohol, then you have to protonate it first because alcohols make horrible leaving groups. Okay, so the first step is that the leaving group leaves. And when the leaving group leaves, here you go, you got CH3. Oh, I'm drawing this a little bit badly. It should be planar, trigonal planar. I apologize for that. Let me make that a little bit different. Because that's going to bug me. When the leaving group leaves, you form a carbon without a group. All right, so when the, you have the carbon without the group, we have to remember back what this is called, right? If it's a carbon without a group, has three groups around it instead of four, you have just formed a carbocation. When you form a carbocation, rearrangements are possible at this point. You have all kinds of possibilities, right? So the leaving group leaves, you form an intermediate. The carbocation is the intermediate that we're forming. All right, so an intermediate is formed at this point, and that's important to note, folks, because when you form an intermediate, anything that goes along with that intermediate on a regular basis, rearrangements, different types of stereochemistry that can be made, right? So if you form a chirality center, you can form all kinds, you can have attack from the top and the bottom, all kinds of possibilities, right? So in that case, when we form this intermediate, there's a lot of things that go along with a carbocation intermediate that are unto themselves important and are all true when we talk about forming that intermediate, no matter where we form it. So if we have in the first part that the leaving group leaves, then in this second part, we're going to have something new attack it. And that something new doesn't have to be a strong electrophile. It's great if it or, I mean, a strong, sorry, <laughs> back up a moment. Not strong electrophile, that's not what I meant to say. I meant a strong nucleophile. It does not have to be a strong nucleophile. In fact, it's better if it usually isn't. Okay, so in terms of looking at this, you're gonna probably have a weak nucleophile instead. Let's do something that's much like my old moment here, the previous one than I had, but it's slightly different. Notice what's going on here. This is methanol, okay? How does methanol differ from the methoxy I used in the last reaction? The difference between these is the H. You, I knew you saw it, right? The difference is the H right there on the O. 
the methoxy anion had a minus charge and an extra lone pair. This does not have an extra lone pair or an extra uh, or a negative charge. This is actually a stable entity just on its own. Okay, so in that case, I have that lone pair right here. We're going to call this the nucleophile. Carbocations, pretty obvious electrophiles. Just make that as a note in your head. And that is going to attack from the top or from the bottom. Doesn't matter which one it is. It could do either, right? So in that case, what I've just formed is I have instead now a CH3, CH3, and I made this attack from the top, O, H, CH3. That should really be a trigonal pyramidal, but that's okay. And this is gonna have a plus charge, um, mainly because oxygen has now made more bonds than it would like, right? When it made the bond between the O and the C, it did not just magically get rid of any of these other bonds. So now we have more bonds than we would like. Let's use this BR that just came off to take off that lovely, the BR that came off that just left is gonna attack my H. Those electrons from the bond will go back onto the O and lo and behold, I have O CH3. Okay. All right. So, starting off at the beginning with the ones, first step is that the leaving group leaves. Second step is that a nucleophile attacks. Then, if the nucleophile is kind of unstable as it is, you do a few things to make it more stable. There it is. Okay. The interesting thing about the ones is that the slowest step is the first one. And we know that we could write a rate law based off just the slowest step, right? So the rate is equal to the, re, uh, the rate constant. I keep on wanting to call that a reaction constant. Sorry, rate constant times the leaving group leaving, right? If you look at the reaction order here, that's the only thing that has a reaction order. And that is not written down, so it's one. So this is first order. This is a first order reaction. Because it's a first order reaction, that's why it has the one. Not because it somehow magically happens in one step. OK? So in terms of looking at this, ease SNs, they both go by the same kind of terminology. If you have the ones, the first step is always the leaving group leaving. Okay? The only difference between an SN and an E is that with the SNs, it attacks the carbocation directly. With an E, you have something that's a little bit perhaps more basic, and it's going to attack the carbon next to the carbocation and pluck an H off of that, which then will make a double bond, okay? But the leaving group leaving, that's the first step for either. Then whether that particular nucleophile is going to be stable, if you do the SN version of this, is based off of um, some other pieces here. And if it's inherently unstable, like an oxygen with three bonds around it, you need to fix that just a little bit to make it something stable. Why did I, the last piece that I want to point out, why did, this is a carbocation, which means it's planar, right? It's trigonal planar, it's a triangle. So why did I not attack from the top for this nucleophile and from the bottom? The reason why is because it didn't matter, okay? The reason why it doesn't matter is because I don't have a chirality center that's being formed here, folks. This is not a stereogenic center. This is not something that you have to worry about in terms of stereochemistry. The reason why is because it has two of the same group off of it. If it had two different groups, and you had four different groups around this carbon, then yes, you have to worry about attacking from the top and the bottom. But if it doesn't, then don't worry about it, okay? 
SN1s versus SN2s. We can talk about solvents here as well. Um, you can already notice that the nucleophile methanol is actually a solvent as well. And so that's an interesting piece in terms of SN1s, that you have polar uh, protic solvents because that actually helps to stabilize the carbocation that is made. Um, and in SN2s, you have polar aprotic solvents. And the reason for that is so that it destabilizes the nucleophile. Okay, we can talk about that way more later. That's kind of the essence of that. That's all we have for SN1 versus SN2. I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, adieu.